Hello, and welcome to the Science of Leadership. My name is Keith Werner, and I am with Cognitive Learning Systems, uh, creators of the Lab Learner program. And what I want to talk about is the science of leadership, but in terms of what can neuroscience bring to the table. Now, our background at Cognitive Learning Systems is more in the application of the neuroscience uh, to curriculum, to professional development with teachers in the K-12 uh, environment. But today I really want to talk about how we can apply it to dealing with issues of leadership as we work with our teachers, as we work with our staff, as we work with our boards of education, members of the public, uh, members of the media. There is a interaction that we carry on all the time with other people. And the important point here, or maybe you one would think of it as the premise of what we're going to talk about today, is that we believe that an understanding of basic human cognition is a very powerful leadership skill. It's a very powerful skill really in any domain, but in particular for leaders that have to work with many different types of people that approach thinking and problem solving in many different ways. And almost always one of the powers of a, a, a successful leader is to bring people with diverse backgrounds, different expertise together to solve common problems. So just an overview of the talk today is we're going to look at a couple different things here. First, we're going to deal with individual differences in thinking, how the different people that we interact with may differ in the way they approach solving problems, communicating with you, communicating with each other. We're going to talk about individual expertise, things that people bring to the table, expertise that they have that uh, make them unique in our groups. And we're also going to talk about individual habits of mind, and that is not so much what they know, what facts they bring to the table, what experiences they've had, but what ways do they actually approach thinking? How do they approach problem solving. And we're going to look at that, the differences that people bring to the table. So that's the individual differences in thinking. And that'll be the beginning of our talk. The second part of the talk will deal more with similarities in thinking. And in that aspect of the talk, we'll probably be dealing much more with the neurocognitive ideas. We'll talk about something called the information processing model, and we'll see that all human beings process information very, very similar ways. And unless we can appreciate and understand the ways, these commonalities in the way people process information, we're not going to be able as leaders to use those similarities and ultimately what we want to do is tie this all together where we're looking at the individual differences of thinking on the one hand, the similarities in thinking on the other hand, and pull them together and be able to see it more holistically that there's differences and there's similarities in all people, in all groups, and that understanding those differences and similarities will help us become better leaders. So let's go ahead and begin with the individual differences in thinking. And when we look at the individual differences in thinking, we can perhaps break this down into two sections. The first being individual expertise and the second being individual habits of mind. And we'll begin by talking about individual expertise. So everybody comes to us, all of our employees, all of the uh, parents, public, everybody comes to us, all individuals come to us with a different package of experiences that make them more or less experts in different areas. So let's begin to explore that by looking at this picture. And let me ask you, when you look at this picture of the trees, what do you see? What we would maintain is depending upon who you are, depending upon your background, you wouldn't look at such a simple scene perhaps quite differently. 
Let's take one example. Let's take a look at this scene in terms of what an artist, what a painter might see as he or she looks at this scene. And there's much more detail here than we really want to talk about. But just giving some examples that if you look at a scene like this as an artist, one of the things that you're going to immediately observe is that objects that appear closest to you are warmer. Their colors are warmer. As you move away, they become more and more cool so that you're starting to move in this scene. If you look at uh, the, the nearby trees, the bright part of the nearby trees, you see more of the, the warm yellows. As you start moving further away, you see more of, uh, of the darker greens. And finally, you start actually getting into the coolest of color, colors in this particular scene, that would be where the blues start coming into play. So if you look at this scene as an artist, you're going to see warm, cool colors. You're also going to notice that you're going to have more contrast in the uh, parts of the trees that are near to us, less contrast as we move farther and farther away. And this is simply the way an artist would look at this quite naturally because of his or her background in expertise. Now, how could we have looked at this besides artistically? Well, what would a botanist see if they saw this very same picture? They might see the density of trees. They might know, be thinking in terms of the species of trees. They might be thinking in terms of the type of grasses that are growing. A groundskeeper would look at this differently. They might see shrubs that need to be trimmed. They may see grass that needs to be fertilized. A photographer would look at it differently. And, or what about a realtor? How would a realtor look at this picture? A realtor may look at this picture in terms of how would they subdivide it in order to sell different packets of land. So we see, and the point of this uh, discussion here has really been to say that people will see the same thing in many different ways ways and it depends upon where they come from where what their background is and what they bring to the table as leaders we're going to want to make sure we are able to use those diverse backgrounds to build up expertise a, a communal expertise in our team now let's take another example of this concept of expertise and let's look at another image here and what this is, is a chessboard that is showing a game that is in progress. When you ask people what they see when they look at this chessboard, we find out that it has everything to do with how much they understand the game of chess. The way this experiment is done is this chessboard is shown to two different people. One of them is a chess master and the other one is a complete novice someone who's never played chess before so both of them are shown this identical setup of chess pieces for i think something like 20 or 30 seconds at the end of the time the uh, chess board is removed and the individuals have to recall where each of the pieces was placed. So the masters, chess masters have to do that, but so do the novices. And what one finds if we do that is the following results. This is by Chase and uh, Simon back in 73 again. What you see is that the first time when you see trial on the bottom and you see number one, after seeing the board for about 20 seconds and then trying to reproduce where all the pieces go, you can see that the beginner or the novice remembers a few pieces, less than five pieces. Well, the chess master recalls over 15 pieces. So a huge difference in the memory for where these pieces belong for the master versus the beginner. Uh, the experiment's actually done different trials. So after you've seen it for 20 seconds, try to reproduce the board. You get to see the original board again for 20 seconds. 
and then try to reproduce the board and so on all the way out to about seven trials. The point here is you can see that after a couple trials, after three trials, the chess expert, the master, is able to completely reproduce the layout of all the pieces, whereas the beginner can't, after all those trials, can't even find uh, the correct location for half of the pieces. So what is this telling us? It, one way we could think of it is just that chess masters are just very smart people and have incredible memories, and so we're not the least bit surprised. But here is, I believe, the most interesting part of this experiment is that all those pieces that we've talked about so far were of a game that was actually in progress. However, if the same number of pieces are placed randomly, that is not in positions of an authentic game, but just randomly on the board, there is absolutely no difference in the recall of the pieces between the chess master and the novice. So the chess master, what we've seen isn't that they have innately better memory or better recall, but they were able to look at those pieces. They were able to look at the chessboard as something was occurring. There was a strategy going. And by grouping the pieces into meaningful placements, they are able to recall the pieces much better than the novice, who was only able to look at them as white and black pieces on a board. So if we think about this kind of an experiment, and we think about what is, what is the neurocognitive research correlate of this, this is an area that many of us may be familiar with as an area of research that involves experts and novices. And so let's take a few minutes and talk about experts and novices. And one of the features of an expert that we're going to talk about is that experts simply know a lot. Experts have a vast amount of knowledge. And this is important because as leaders, we have a group of people and the different people in that group can have different types of knowledge based upon their expertise, which in turn was based upon their experience. Now, in terms of knowledge, psychologists usually classify knowledge into a few different categories. One is uh, the declarative knowledge. This is uh, knowledge of concepts and facts and principles. But this is not always the most important or and certainly not the only type of knowledge that expert had. They also have procedural knowledge, and that is they know how to do things. And even more important than that is conditional knowledge, and that is when to do certain things, when to apply certain rules. This is sort of, in the chess example, this is something that the chess master had. They had a knowledge of, of how to organize pieces for uh, defense or for offense. They know when to make certain moves, when not to make certain moves, when to expect your opponent to make certain moves based on what you've done. The, all those things will go into why the chess master was able to recall so many pieces versus the beginner or the novice. So one of the things that it's a feature of experts is that they know a lot. The other thing is, is that they know how to organize their knowledge. Our discussion about the chess master really focused on the organization of knowledge. Things like concepts and procedures and rules are related to one another by an expert. The concepts are centered around principles, so there will be underlying principles when an expert organizes knowledge. And that the, this type of organization facilitates pattern recognition. And that's one of the things that experts in different areas are able to do. They're, act, they're able to look at things that appear random to somebody else and actually see patterns. And when you see patterns, that facilitates recognition, storage, and retrieval. So when you see patterns and you can recall patterns, you're remembering and recalling many pieces, not just one. So that one piece of information comes to mind. Other relevant information is also remembered as well. 
If we now turn to the next and the last uh, feature of an expert that I'd like to talk about is that experts diagnose problems and connect diagnosis to solutions. This obviously is extremely important in the medical sciences. Experts recognize different types of problems. They don't look at problems as just random things coming in. They see issues. They see physical conditions or whatever the issue is that we're studying. They see them as types. Again, this is somewhat related to recognizing patterns. Experts ask questions to help them figure out what kind of problem they're dealing with. And that's part of a physical examination and taking of a history that physicians, for example, would use when uh, talking to their patients. Knowledge of problems is connected with the knowledge of procedures for solving that problem. Yes, we're talking about physicians in this particular picture, in this particular example, but engineers will do the same thing. Attorneys will do the same thing. Business people faced with cash flow problems or superintendents faced with budgetary problems are going to look at what type of problem it is and what type of solution may be most applicable and most fruitful to pursue. Okay, so that's what experts are. And among the features of experts, again, these are the features of individual expertise are what we attempt to glean when we look at someone's resume. So as you're building a team in whatever level of education that you're working in or whatever level of leadership you're working in, we're able to look at a resume or we call them a CV sometimes at the university and based on the resume, we're able to look at things like what their college majors and minors were, what kind of coursework they took. This is going to tell us something about what they know, that, that part of knowledge. It's going to give us, it's going to let us glean something about what kind of repertoire of knowledge that this individual will bring. It will give us something in indication of their work experience and what their extracurricular activities are, things like this. This gives us an idea of what differences of individual expertise somebody would be bringing to our team. Okay, so these are, we've discussed up to this point, individual differences in the way people think. And we began by focusing on differences in expertise. So now let's turn to that second element of individual differences in thinking. And we said that that was individual habits of mind. How do we approach solving problems? How do we know that by looking at a resume? Very, very difficult to do that. We see this more when we interview somebody than when we look at the resume, and we will really ultimately not really understand how somebody thinks, solves problems, interacts with other people until we're actually working with them and see them in the working situation. And these are issues that we may bring up during annual reviews with people, ways in which they uh, approach thinking and learning, problem solving, things like this. So among the individual habits of mind, we're not going to go through this in great detail. This is, the, you can look this up. The source is Costa and Akalik 2000. There are things like persistence, managing impulsivity, how flexible you are in your thinking, responding with wonderment and awe. One of the ones that I think that all of us look at is whether or not you're going to take responsibility for uh, suggestions and risks that you take, and even down to finding humor in a situation. These are all ways that make us different in the way we approach th things. But these, again, are things that are very difficult to glean on a resume, and even in a short interview, it's kind of hard. So in recent times, questions have been asked is, can we... Can this type of information, these habits of mind, can they be quantified in any way? So that the answer really is that's, that's what pre-employment testing, personality testing is. Uh, many of the types of tests that 
employers give to potential employees, individual habits of mind are trying to be dissected out of large numbers of applicants. One of the types of tests of, these, uh, of this nature that uh, cognitive learning systems is actually used in the, in the past and still uses is the so-called DISC test, where we look at dominant, influential, compliant, and steady types of individuals. And there are multiple choice questions that are given that actually allow you to rate the different types of, of, of habits of mind, collective habits of mind. You can see in the dominant, in the upper left, you see direct, decisive, doers. Uh, in the lower right and green, the steady, the S part of the DISC assignment, that's stable, supportive, su and sincere. These are different types of people, and we have all these different types of people in a large group that's working together for us, usually on our team. Okay, so up to this point, we have talked about individual differences in thinking. We've talked about individual expertise, which we did in terms of uh, the how an artist would look at something. We discussed in some great detail the difference between an, a novice and a chess master and how they would look at, at uh, a chessboard. And we talked about how those individual expertise are going to have an impact uh, on what these people bring to the table as we try to organize a leadership team. We also talked about individual habits of mind, and we said that people think differently, they approach problem solving differently, and these are somewhat separate from the knowledge base that is acquired from individual expertise and individual experiences and are more a part of the nature of the way people process information cognitively, how they solve problems, how they approach dynamics of working in groups, so on and so forth, that the individual expertise could be gleaned somewhat from a resume, whereas habits of mind much more difficult to glean from a resume comes up more in an interview and even more so when we work with people. And that these taken together are sort of the types of differences in thinking that the people that we work with have. So from this point on, I would like to sort of turn the conversation and begin talking about not the differences in thinking, but similarities in thinking. As we turn our attention from the differences in thinking among human beings and start to consider the similarities in thinking, we shouldn't be surprised that we think very much the same from a biological or physiological perspective. And this is because even though DNA-wise, there's about, between any two different individuals, there's about three million differences in our DNA, that still leaves us to be about 99.9% .9 identical to each other in our DNA sequence. Even if we go to something like a chimpanzee, our nearest relative in the animal kingdom, we're about 99% identical to chimpanzees in our DNA sequence. So the differences that we have between each other really pale in comparison to the many similarities we have. The proteins that we make, the enzymes, the metabolic pathways, the different structures, the way our eyes work, the way our hearing works, very, very, very similar between individuals of the same human species. So with all of these many, many similarities, it shouldn't surprise us that the human brain is very similar between individuals. And that's going to be expressed in the way we think. If we begin our discussion of the human brain and look at it from a neurosurgeon's point of view, we see that the brain 
weighs about 1,400 grams. That's about three pounds. But the interesting thing is, is while that only constitutes about 2% of our entire body mass, the brain as an organ uses about 20% of the energy that our body consumes. And so the brain, even though it has no moving parts like our muscles do or our heart, still consumes this enormous amount of energy. So it's got to be doing something with all of that energy. One of the things that it does is it maintains our blood pressure. It controls our reflexes. It does uh, many things that are very physiological in nature. But the other thing that it does is that it processes information. It thinks. It learns. It can memorize and it can solve problems. And so a large part of the energy that our bodies consume are consumed by our brains. Now, if we look not so much at from the neurosurgeon's view of the brain, it as an organ, and look at it more in terms of a functional perspective, we have something called the information processing model. And this model of learning and memory is a model that all educators, I believe, should be familiar with. And what we'll do is talk about this model at least enough so that you can see that all human beings are going to follow a similar path, a fundamentally similar path, as we learn and remember things. And eventually, we'll talk about how we solve problems and how we think. And so let's take a look at this information processing model in a little bit more detail. And we begin by inputting information into the system. No information reaches our brain unless it comes through our five senses. The view of our world around us, it comes in through what we see, hear, smell, touch, and taste. And that information is constantly being fed by our senses into our brain. Now, much of that information that comes into our brain never actually is processed any further. And this is a good thing because during the course of the minutes of our life, many, many sensory stimuli are coming into our senses that we needn't concern ourselves with. So we don't, when, if you're listening to me talk now, you're probably not thinking about the position of your left foot, but you could focus on the position of your left foot, where it is in relation to your right foot, where it is in relation to the chair that you're sitting in. You could be focusing on background sounds. You could be focusing on the temperature. You could be focusing on your back on the chair that you're sitting in, whatever. All of this information is coming into us at all times, and most of it never really enters what we may call our consciousness because it is filtered out by something that many people refer to as a sensory register. So most information doesn't go any further from our senses and into our cognition and this information processing pathway, but are forgotten. And there's a number of steps along the way of this information processing model, any of these three sets of arrows going down, that leads to what we say here is forgotten information, things that have come into our consciousness and do not remain in our consciousness and certainly don't lead to long-term memories or learning. So the first place that we lose information is at the input stage, that first set of arrows on the left. And that is to say that most information that is coming in from our sensory organs is simply not processed any further. Information that does make it past our sensory register and becomes uh, enters into our consciousness, enters something that we can call working memories or short-term memory. And this working memory is limited in two respects. First of all, it cannot hold a great deal of information. It can only hold several pieces of information before 
bringing in new information simply swamps out our short-term memory or our working memory, and we begin to forget things that were in there already as they are replaced with new information. This is the kind of short-term memory that we may associate with if we try to memorize a telephone number and we're thinking about those digits, trying to remember them, and then somebody comes up and talks to us or gives us another number, and what we do is we forget the first number. This is the kind of thing that when we think we're sitting in the living room and we want to get something from the kitchen, we get up, we walk into the kitchen, we find ourselves in the kitchen, but no longer remember what it was that we went into the kitchen for. Not only is working memory limited in terms of the amount of information it can hold, but it's also limited in how long we'll hold that information. We hold that information we'll, uh, in our working memory for moments, for minutes perhaps, and then it is going to be replaced by other information, other thoughts that we will be processing in its place. Okay, so we have information enters the brain, not all of it enters our working memory. Most of it is forgotten, but some of it does enter our working memory. Now, once it's in our working memory, it can lead further down the pathway to something that we call consolidation. And what consolidation is, is basically the movement of information from working memory to long-term memory. Now, long-term memory is we, we really don't know what the capacity of our brain is for the amount of memories, amount of information we can remember, or for how long it can be stored. Perhaps for an entire lifetime, how many times do we recall something that happened 20 years ago that we never thought of within that 20-year period? Never thought of before, but we can remember it, and once we remember it, we have a perfect memory of it. That shows us just how long our long-term memories can be. But the process of taking information from our short-term working memory and moving it into long-term memory is a process called consolidation. And this process of consolidation requires the expenditure of energy because one of the things that happens during consolidation is that our brain is physically changed. We make new synapses. Uh, this is connections between the neurons, our brain cells. And in order to do that, genes are turned on, proteins are synthesized, and these cellular structures are, are, are built to con connect different nerve cells or different neurons together in our brain. So consolidation is a very complex process. It requires energy expenditure, and it leads to the formation of long-term memories. But again, this is a complex structure, and it really involves all the other arrows that you see here. You have to pay attention to the information. The other thing that has to happen during consolidation is that no new information that enters into our brain is alone. It is always compared to information that we already have in our brain. So that when new information enters into our working memory and we start processing it, it we end up trying to retrieve information from our long-term memory that we deem as relevant to this new information. And that form uh, or that process we can call retrieval. And a retrieval, again, is getting information that has been stored in our long-term memory and comparing it in our working memory to new information that we're currently processing. When we do this, when we retrieve information, we pay attention to it, and we process that information. Consolidation can occur, and this can lead to long-term memories. Now, the retrieval of information from long-term memory sort of was the focus of the last book that we, we wrote that was on the spiraling curriculum, the, the concept of a spiraling curriculum that when over a course of years, if we're able to re constantly refer back to what students have learned already as we teach them new information, we can spiral that information. And the reason a spiraling curriculum works so well is because of this fundamental process of retrieval, 
whereby we compare new information that we are learning to information that we already have and try to fit it together. Okay, so you can see that while we lose information as we go from input to working memory, leading to forgotten, not all memories that not not all information that ends up in working memory gets all the way to the process of consolidation. A lot of that information is just simply forgotten along the way. And even during the process of consolidation, not everything that we attempt to learn, not everything that we are processing ends up leading to long-term memories and new synapse formation. And that information, again, is forgotten. Once things are forgotten, there is no way to bring in that new that information that forgotten information has to re-enter the system again through input we can't bring it in at some other point okay so we've looked at input we looked at working memory consolidation long-term memory now the next question and this leads to, i think uh, to a large uh, component of what we need to think of when we think of leadership and working together with groups of people to solve problems has to do with an overarching concept called executive functions. Executive functions, as you're looking at this information processing model, you may be wondering, well, when we have a new piece of information, new information in our working memory, and we want to compare it to something that we already know in our long-term memory, how do we decide what is relevant information in our long-term memory? Well, that is something that is that we refer to as executive functions. Uh, we, when we are processing information from working to long-term memory, we have to decide what we're going to attend to. What do we pay attention to? If we're in class and, and the teacher is talking, or if you're sitting here right now listening to me talking, you are having to consciously decide what to pay attention to. So all of these things are going on at one time, and the question is, how do you know what to focus on? How do you know what to go into your long-term memory to find that is relevant to what is in your working memory and that you're trying to consolidate? Well, again, this is something called executive functions. And now we turn our attention to these executive functions. I like to think of an analogy of an executive function as somewhat of a conductor that is con conducting all the various uh, instruments in a large orchestra, all of them coming together with the right uh, beat and performing a piece of music. In our executive functions, we have a number of different steps along the way or different components of executive functions. And I really, this is a talk in and of itself, but I would just point out it's things like inhibition and in order to think of something new, to shift, you need to shift your attention, which is a, another point of executive functions, but you have to be able to inhibit what you were thinking of before. So executive functions have to say, okay, we're going to think about something new now, which means we're going to shift to a new topic, but it's also going to be that because our working memory is so small, we have to inhibit thinking about whatever it is we were thinking about before. Well, the list goes on in executive functions dealing with emotional control, and I'll say a little bit more about emotional control in a minute. Uh, but again, now we come down, you can see we're talking about working memory, and Executive functions, functions in uh, the information processing model, as I described on the previous slides, in sort of organizing the entire uh, process. So all of these components of executive function down through self-monitoring are all components of executive functions. And without getting in any more detail of that, let's just take a look at how executive functions develop uh, over the course of our lifetime. We are not born with a great deal of executive functions. So that if you follow this line here, you can see that you very slow development in executive functions till maybe around three years old. And then you see this rapid increase up through five, five and a half years old. And then you see that it continues to increase through adolescence and into adulthood.
Interestingly, the greatest increase in executive functions occurs during the time that we would be in school, either in K-12 or in uh, including the university as well, running roughly from preschool through college. The reason that executive function is increasing over periods of time is that our brain is continuing to develop over that same period of time. And if we were to look at the developing brain with the blue and the purple being the highly developed and the yellows and the reds being less developed, you can see that many parts of the brain are developing in these years, but the most significant part of the brain probably for the executive functions that we're talking about is the front part of the brain, referred to as the frontal lobe or prefrontal lobe. For mathematical uh, ability, other parts of our brain are important as well as the frontal lobes. The uh, parietal lobe, for example, and the sides of our brain are also very important. And th as these parts of our brains develop, we're able to perform different types of cognitive functions more effectively. Returning to, again, executive functions and looking at executive functions, just to give you an idea, I think it just an example might be appropriate here. And let's just look at executive functions in early development. So when a child or an infant, they have the senses there to touch, to hear, to taste, to see, to smell. They have all of these senses, but they do not begin by being integrated. They're independent of each other. And it is executive functions with time, as the structures of the brain develop, that begin to tie these various functions and sensory experiences together into some sort of a meaningful, interpretable picture of the world around us. So that when we see something, we may then suspect what it's going to taste like or what it's, if we smell something, we may be able to imagine what it looks like. Or if we hear something, we may be able to envision what it looks like. So what I want to do is demonstrate just one of these connections that is established very early on between speech or language and vision. And what we're going to do is something called a Stroop test. You're going to see a series of words that will appear on the screen and all that you need to do is when you see the word, I would like you to, to say out loud, you could say it to yourself or out loud, the color of the text. So if you see the word R-E-D in red text, you say red. However, if you see the word G-R-E-E-N in red text, you say red. So in other words, you're saying the color of the text. And I want you to say these words either to yourself or out loud. I'll say the first few with you out loud, and you say the rest. And here we go. Red. Yellow. Red. Okay, Stroop test is, 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 works so well. And what you probably felt was a certain amount of confusion. Now, if we do a Stroop test in a MRI and we actually look at the part of the brain that is active during a Stroop test, one of the parts of the brain that really is active is called the anterior cingulate cortex. And this is in our frontal lobe. This is in the area of the brain that we would associate with executive functions. And the interior cingulate cortex is in a unique position in the brain because it has connections both to our cognitive prefrontal lobe, so where we're thinking, but it also has connections to an emotional component in our brain in what we call the limbic system. So 
this part of the brain lights up for two because it is we're trying to to solve that problem between the difference of the text and what the word says but it's also having an effect on us it's not uncommon for people or at least myself even when i do a stroop test i i have an uncomfortable feeling and this is related to the emotional aspect of this anterior cingulate cortex and I bring up this an emotional aspect because I don't want us, as we discuss the brain and the neurocognitive view of the brain, to overlook the role that emotions play in our thinking. And I would like to just point out a book that isn't a recent book. This was published in 95 by Antonio Damasio, a great neuropsychologist. And the name of the book is Descartes' Error. And basically, since Descartes famously proclaimed, I think, therefore I am, science and scientists have often overlooked the emotional aspect as, as a source of a person's being, uh, uh, of the way they process information. And if you were to take the time to read this book, you would find that a number of Damasio's patients, when you have damage to parts of the brain that would impact an individual's emotions that you, one might guess if you went by Descartes' way of thinking that everything was rational, the less emotion that was involved, that people that had lost through damage their emotional capacities of their brains or emotional functions, that they would be great thinkers. But in fact, what you find is that people that have had damage, patients that have had damage to the emotional centers of the brain that sort of incapacitates the ability to bring emotion into uh, problem solving, they tend to be very disorganized, uh, not very good at making plans, not very good at carrying out plans. So what we get from these types of studies is that emotions are not just a luxury. They're essential to rational thinking and to normal social behavior. And I want us to think about that as we think in terms of leadership qualities, that we have to protect that emotional uh, aspect of the way people think in order to be able to have them become, to be very good problem solvers and to work well in groups. Now, when we think about intelligence, and I think that at speaking to educators in general, they like to think in terms of intelligence as opposed to executive functions and brain structures. Let's go back to the Howard Gardner multiple intelligences, where you have all of these differences that people will bring to the table in terms of how they go about learning and thinking and interacting. So all of these... Are, are, are sort of going along with this concept that, that there's differences between us. But what I would like to talk about is when we, how do these all relate? How do all these different intelligences relate to our information processing model that we've talked about, which we've now been able to identify certain brain structures with? And I think that if we want to sort of think about intelligence, that Push it, looking again at similarities instead of differences in people, we find that if we look at executive functions and intelligence, we can maybe look at two different fundamental kinds of intelligence. One is crystallized intelligence and one is fluid intelligence. And I think that these are good ways or useful ways of looking at intelligence when we're talking about education, but also when we're talking about leadership. Let's start off by looking at crystallized intelligence, which is more associated with knowledge, whereas fluid intelligence has more to do with the information processing system. So we begin by looking at crystallized intelligence, and this is the ability to use learned knowledge and experience, and really points to things like the mastery of facts and figures, terms, rules, procedures, habits. Really, this gets back to the kinds of things that we're able to ascertain or at least get a glimpse of when we look at somebody's resume because it, it shows us their past expertise. It doesn't show us necessarily 
their habits of mind, which is much more of a, a, a factor if when we talk about fluid intelligence rather than crystallized intelligence. So again, crystallized intelligence, the, the facts and the figures of an individual and what they may bring to the table or bring to one of our leadership groups. Let's turn now to fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence is more involved with the ability to solve new problems and use logic in new situations and to identify patterns. Okay, so this is more of an issue of problem solving, testing ideas, generating possibilities, planning steps, modeling, identifying cause-effect relationships. These are the kinds of skills and intelligences that come to play in our working groups, in our leadership groups. So once again, people are bringing with them the crystallized intelligence based on all their backgrounds, but they're also bringing with them a fluid intelligence, a fluid intelligence being harder to discern than the crystallized intelligence. As a means of review of what we discussed so far then today, we began by talking about the individual differences in thinking, and then we moved into similarities in thinking. When we talked about individual differences in thinking, we, we broke it down into two uh, essential components, the first of which was individual expertise, which we used examples of how an artist may look at a scene versus how a botanist or a realtor may look at a countryside scene. And we talked about, we also brought up the concept of how expertise leads to certain traits in individuals, their ability to organize information in different ways, and so on. We also discuss individual habits of mind, which are somewhat different than the individual expertise and have more of a way of thinking in what we may now call more of a fluid intelligence rather, crystal, rather than crystallized intelligence. We then moved on and discussed similarities in thinking and went over the information processing model and spent a, a considerable amount of time talking about how we consolidate and store information and ultimately how the whole process of our thinking is controlled by something we call executive functions. In conclusion, we've discussed the homogeneity and the heterogeneity of human cognition. We've discussed individual differences and similarities in thinking.